Hi, I'm DJ Ware, and this is the Cyber Gizmo. So here we are back on a Monday, and it's time to look at the news again. So yeah, I am really going to do this. Huh? So yeah, so welcome back to your weekly uh, Linux deep dive. This isn't fluff. I'm not putting in the, the, the best corporate stories in here. These are the top stories that I think will affect you and me. I know they'll affect me. I don't know about you, but... Uh, yeah, these, it, it, these are the top ones that I chose. So, and these cover anywhere from running a Pi in your, uh, your garage to a full stack in your lab. It also is going to talk about rust. It's going to talk about tariffs. It's going to talk about a little bit of kernel drama and a surprise win for Linux gamers. How about that, huh? So let, let's get to it. This isn't a drill. The United States just eliminated the tariff exemption on imported goods that cost under $800. So for hobbyists and budget uh, conscious builders, that's a direct hit. It, isn't, it won't be just a direct hit for uh, U.S. buyers either. Uh, those tariffs will probably impact costs going a across the board. Uh, yeah, uh, they won't just reprice their items for the U.S. They'll reprice them for the entire market, would be my guess. We'll see. So here's the scenario. Single-board computers and mini PCs like the Raspberry Pi 5, the Radnorock 5B, and Chinese-made N9, N100 or N97 boxes could be all the way up uh, to some of the... Uh, some of the smaller AMD and uh, Intel 12th gen, which sell for under $800. So those are suddenly subject to the full and import tariff. That can mean as much as a 15 to 25% increase in the price, depending upon the country of origin and the shipping method. And it won't just be the U.S. The manufacturers raise prices to offset U.S. tariff, it'll be a base price increase across the board, which will ripple uh, globally. So let's say that you're eyeing a $159 Pi-based kit. You might see the hit as $185 or more. Now, if you multiply that across you know, a classroom order or a maker project, maybe a home lab uh, components or an expansion you have planned, Suddenly, it's a real barrier, uh, yeah, because your costs are going up, uh, and it might make it that you can only do so much. And this isn't speculation. Vendors like Ameridroid and Seed Studio are already rewriting their shipping policies. So whether they eat the cost, which is highly unlikely, given the small margins they already make, or they pass it along, which I expect that's exactly what they'll do, Expect fewer deals, uh, fewer coupon codes, more bundled pricing to try to mask the hike a little bit. Bottom line, if you're holding off on buying a new board, now may be your last chance before the Q3 prices surge. So the second story is Rust is uh, expanding inside the kernel. It's not, it's not a, as big as an expansion as you might might think, but it is starting to merge into the heavy traffic areas of the Linux kernel. So this is starting with 6.17, and we're seeing one of the most substantial Rust integrations to date. Where they're concentrating includes expanded abstractions for memory, safe drivers, scaffolding for future subsystems, and cleaner module loading logic written entirely in Rust. It's not replacing C, at least not yet. I suspect that will happen. But it's displacing the high-risk zones where C has historically been fragile and trouble. <laughs> yeah, so that's what, they're, that's what they're going after, is try to reduce some of the areas where the kernel has been brittle. By brittle, uh, so, so what does that mean? Well, it means it's creating bugs and possibly CVEs. Rust forces compile time safety around memory threading and ownership. That means that there's fewer null pointers, no 
double freeze and and freeze as in free memory and not mitigations against use after free exploits. So some of you have asked, will this bloat the kernel? It's not likely. If anything, it probably will shrink the kernel a little bit because uh, Rust is a lot, the, the components come lean and are modular. So the challenge is uh, cross-compilation tooling, making sure that the old configs don't break. But as these wrinkles smooth out, expect future drivers, especially for things like USB and audio and embedded interfaces uh, to be written entirely in Rust. So yeah, Rust is now part of your kernel. Whether you like it or not, it's probably going to make things better. We'll see. The bit of drama occurred with Intel's Quick Assist Accelerator. It got benched again in uh, the other Linux kernel 617. This is the, I think this this time, the reason kind of stings a bit. So uh, in the latest Linux 617 development cycle, QAT, which is what it's formally called, was eliminated for the second time. First, it's underperforming AVX 512. Yeah, standard CPU instructions. And file encryption benchmarks using basic FS crypt. So it failed, it failed to demonstrate any compelling kernel space benefit at all. And, you know, no savings, no time savings. It, it actually, in fact, in some cases, slowed things down. It's like, uh-oh, that's not going to fly. So this, this, that's a major blow to QAT because uh, I think they might be, there was, it was supposed to be Intel's answer to crypto offloading uh, and handling things like TLS and compression, encryption faster than your CPU could do it. But when the open source community benchmarked it, the results were dismal. Also, they found bugs that was unstable and in some cases slower than just letting the CPU handle it on its own. That raises some serious questions about Intel's direction. They've been emphasizing accelerators, you know, the need for accelerators, both in AI, QAT, FPGA, overlays and this is these features uh, and if those features don't outperform the conventional me methods in Linux why bother I mean what's the point just to add more code for the fun of it so there's uh, also the the broader trust issue the Linux kernel uh, maintainers don't like half-baked hardware features and if you can't maintain your driver stack don't expect long-term kernel inclusion they'll just throw you out so unless Intel steps up with major firmware and driver patches, Q QAT may go the way of Intel's other misfires. Uh, mostly, in, it's going to be mostly in, uh, flashy in the slides, but invisible in the real world. So for now, if you've got a QAT hardware in your rack, maybe don't rely on it so much for a critical encryption task. One of the bright spots this week was the release of FEX 2508, that just dropped, and uh, they're still working on the parts of it to get out packages, so expect those to come shortly, but they're not there as of the time I looked this morning. What is FEX? FEX is a, is a uh, emulator that translates between uh, x86-64 code and ARM. So it allows, basically, it is like Rosetta. It allows x86-64 code to run on an ARM-based machine running Linux. Does it work on Apple? Yes, it does. They did some real-world testing with 2508, comparing it to the last version, which I think was 2007.1. So that's just like a month ago. Uh, and they found a 39% increase in frame rate between that one and this one. <laughs> and that was with Cyberpunk 2077. That's no rounding error. That, that's playability right there, I think. So how are they pulling this off? Well, FEX 2508 includes a deep instruction cache uh, that's smarter. It also has a just-in-time uh, compilation. 
and a reduced syscall overhead. Anytime you can reduce syscall, you're going to gain performance in a hurry. So the result is big games run faster on ARM, laptops, Chromebooks, and even single board computers with beefy GPUs. So this is a major win for ARM on in, in a general purpose platform. And a reminder that Linux on ARM isn't just about efficiency anymore. Now it's about access and performance. Yeah, this is going to be interesting to see how this plays out long term uh, and how it will actually do up against, you know, when you start throwing wine into the mix and steam into the mix, what it actually is going to do. But uh, it's going to be interesting to do some deeper tests on this. Maybe compare it to a Ryzen, I don't know, I've got... I've got the Ryzen 9 370, HX 370 here. I could try that. I wish I could compare it against an M3, but running Linux on an M3 is going to be a bit problematic. Uh, but yeah, for now, just know this, that ARM gaming on Linux is no longer a joke. Yeah, it's starting, it's starting to come about. But comparing it to the last version, that's fine. But the real comparison is how does it compare against a real 3... A, an x86 machine. This is uh, called the Deferred Unwinder and uh, S-Frame hit. <laughs> so yeah, S this is not S-Frames in terms of the ones that are used by graphics cards. These are stack frames. Uh, these are used by the kernel. So if you ever had to chase a kernel panic, and maybe you haven't, but if you ever have, you know that stack traces are often the difference between finding the bug and throwing your entire machine out the window. Yeah, especially in the early morning hours. So entered uh, <laughs> Deferred Unwinder Infrastructure, what a name, was merged into Linux 617. Uh, it goes into a lot of depth here. So I, I think let's just let's just keep this high level here. So basically, it's, this is offering a compact platform uh, agnostic format that survives compiler optimizations. This makes it a lot easier to unwind what's happened uh, when your program hit a failure point. So unwinding is the ability to roll the program back to where it actually failed because on modern processors, where it failed is not always where it stopped because <laughs> it could have failed, you know, uh, 20 seconds ago. And, and so that's what you're unwinding. You're trying to figure out where it actually failed and why. So that basically is what this is going to help us with. So that wraps up this week. Uh, if you want to know more details about that story, about the uh, unwinder, go to their webpage and, and you can dive into the details with it. Uh, Rust is rising. Intel is slipping. And yeah, the knocks just keep coming. Uh, I have one comment about that before I move on, though. You know, laying off a, a, a quarter of your workforce expect more of that that's usually the pay that's the payment uh, back to the company for removing people in critical projects is that those projects don't work anymore there's not there's not the brain trust there to keep them running there or to keep them updated and so expect more failures along that line yeah uh, and uh, arms uh, fighting back with uh, with uh, the uh, new version of the translator all while Linux just made debugging easier and many PCs a little bit pricier. So subscribe if, uh, if you want more stories like this and you want me to keep doing the news. I'm planning, hopefully, by the 9th to roll out a video on Debian 13. That is the planned release date, but with Debian, the planned release dates don't matter. It's the release date where everything is working perfect. I mean, they might, I have seen them go right by that, <laughs> that planned release date. Depends on how, how big a change this is. And from what I can see, yeah, the Debian 13 is shaping up to be a really nice release. Uh, it, it, it's offering a lot of new things that I'm excited about anyway. Also, I planned this week of all times to be worried about, actually, this is probably a good time to look at this before the tariffs go into effect. I'll be looking at another N97 board. 
uh, and and uh, mini PC. And so, yeah, I'll be introducing that to you, doing a, a base review on it, putting it through its uh, paces, and maybe comparing it against some of the other boards that I've looked at in the past. Uh, yes, and then, yeah, we'll see how it goes from there. But until then, <laughs> stay cautious and stay sharp, and also stay free. I'm DJ Ware, and this has been the Cyber Gizmo. Please like and subscribe. See you then. Bye.